Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I'm, I'm going to talk in English. Unfortunately, I don't know Russian, and I cannot speak in Greek for you, so I will speak in English. So it's my great pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the organizers. It's always a great pleasure to be in this city. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, 30 minutes, I'm going to cover the whole spectrum of uh, cancer of a non-primary. Well, let's start first with the first question. What is the incidence of cancer of a non-primary? The answer is that uh, up to now, the incidence of uh, cancer of a non-primary used to be between 3 and 5%. But recently, both in Europe and the United States, uh, there is a decline in the incidence of CAP. And this is due, most probably, to the improved diagnostics. We have better immunohistochemistry. We have gene profiling. We have better imaging. But also, we have better control of smoking. So this is a, a, a slide shows you uh, the decline of uh, CAP in different European uh, countries as well as, an, as well as in Australia. Let's see the clinical presentation. This is a classical uh, young man with uh, left supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. This is a lady with uh, subcutaneous nodes without a primary site. A man with a huge liver full of metastatic disease without any primary site. And this is a, a young man with uh, bilateral lung metastasis without a primary site. Second question is, what is the natural history of uh, patients with cancer of a non-primary? There are some characteristics of this disease, I would call it disease, uh, is the early dissemination there is a clinical absence of the primary site at the presentation. Most of the tumors in cancer of non primaries are aggressive diseases. And there is an unpredictable metastatic pattern. The most important question is, is cancer of non primary site one or more than one diseases? And if you look at this table here, you will see that histologically, we have almost 85% uh, of the cases to be adenocarcinoma. 10% are squamous cell carcinoma, and the rest 5% are different kind of tumors. But if you look at this slide, this is the uh, main slide of my talk. If you remember this slide, it means that you learn what cancer of a non-primary is. So we have a number of different clinical pathological entities. Either we have subsets with liver metastasis mainly, or you have patients with lymph node metastasis, either in the mediastinal or the erythroperitoneal area, or in the axilla, or in the cervical region, or the inguinal region. But also we have patients with peritoneal cavity disease, with peritoneal adenocarcinomatosis in females. We have patients with malignant ascites, which is not a papillary or serous adenocarcinoma. And we have also from the lungs, where we might, we might have lung metastasis or we have pleural metastasis. But also, sorry, also we have uh, bone metastasis, either one or more than one. We have brain metastasis, and we have patients with neuroendocrine tumors or melanoma of a non-primary. So the answer is that cancer of a non-primary, it's not one disease. It's more than one disease. What about the investigation of trying to find the primary site? Let's see together this uh, al algorithm. You need a good histopathology with very good immunohistochemistry and sometimes with molecular profiling. You need imaging studies with conventional radiology 
ultrasonography, CTs or MRIs, mammography, and sometimes PET CTs. And then we go to endoscopy. You can have all kinds of endoscopies try to identify the primary tumor. And then have a look on the histopathology and immunohistochemistry. I'll stick only on the cytokeratins, CK7 and CK20, it's very, very useful. And look again at this algorithm. If you have a patient with adenocarcinoma who has CK, CK7 positive and CK20 positive, probably your patient has one of these tumors. If your patient has CK7 positive and CK20 negative, here are the tumors uh, which your patient might have. If you have CK7 negative and CK20 positive, you might have either colorectal cancer or Merkel cell carcinoma. And if you have both CK7 and CK20 negative, you might deal with one of these tumors. You want to take a picture of that, I know. And then we move to the molecular analysis. This is true that we, if we do molecular analysis, we can have 80 to 90 percent uh, the primary site. But I'll leave that for later on. And these are the assays available in the market to get uh, uh, your patient having a gene expression profiling test. And then we go to the endoscopy, and here I would like to draw your attention that you do not have to do endoscopies to your patients from the top to the bottom in order to get the primary site. But you just do it in patients who have relative symptoms or signs. So I'll go for an ENT and endoscopy if, for example, my patient has cervical nodes. I'll go for a bronchoscopy if my patient has a radiographic mass or some symptoms. The same thing for colonoscopy, proctoscopy, or colposcopy. So the lesson here, the message here, is don't do endoscopies to your patients from the top to the bottom. What about the imaging studies? CT scans, useful, about 40% can give you the primary site. MRI, especially for the breast, is accurate in 60%. But be careful, PET scan, it's not yet accepted as a method of being able to identify the primary tumor in all your patients. What we need for that is some prospective studies which we do not have yet. But in general, if you have a patient with a hidden head and neck cancer, this PET scan is quite useful. And then we move to the serum tumor markers. Please don't overdo that because they are not any, they do not have any prognostic or diagnostic or preventive uh, predictor, predicting uh, assistance. But you do it sometimes if you have, for example, patients with bone metastatic adenocarcinoma, you do a PSA. If you have patients with uh, undifferentiated tumor, you do, and he's a young man, you do uh, the BHCG on AFP. Again, for the hepatic tumors, you do the AFP. And ladies with uh, adenocarcinoma of the peritoneum, do a CA125 and CA53 to patients with adenocarcinoma involving the axillary nodes. Now, what is the treatment? The major question here is, do we have effective drugs to treat these patients, or we do have just some responsive substance? And the answer here is that no, we don't have one disease. We have a basket with several fruits, so you have to be careful. And if we go back to 2003, this was the first paper we published with our friends from the United States. And we identified at that time that CAP is divided in two big groups, is the good prognosis group and the poor prognosis group. And uh, let's start with the good prognosis group, which unfortunately, keep that in mind, it's only 20% of the whole 
population of these patients. Uh, these are the patients with favorable subsets, women with adenocarcinoma involving the axillary lymph nodes, which look like breast cancer, women with papillary adenocarcinoma of the peritoneum, looks like ovarian cancer, squamous cell carcinoma involving the cervical node, look like head neck cancer, and again, uh, patients with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, adenocarcinoma with a colon profile, this is a very new entity, I'll come back to that later, and also the renal cell carcinoma, and men with blastic bone metastasis and elevated PSA, patients with isolated inguinal adenopathy, or patients with a single, small, potentially resectable tumor. So let's start with the first subset, women with occult primary breast carcinoma, which present to you with only axillary lymphadenopathy. Uh, these are mostly ductal adenocarcinoma, 40% ERPR positive and 30% HER2. Men, sorry, mean age 52 years, and they are postmenopausal in 66%. You should treat these patients like having a patient of stage two breast cancer. You are not able to find distant metastasis if you do staging, it's very rare, and the five year survival is similar to breast cancer. Now we move to uh, the second subset, which is patients with primary peritoneal adenocarcinoma, where you might have here patients with uh, similarities with advanced ovarian cancer, median age of 60 years, Histopathology, be careful, should be serous or papillary adenocarcinoma, and not mucinous, and not clear cell. Should be all the time serous or papillary. Serum marker is increased, and these patients should be treated like patients with stage three or four ovarian cancer. And the response rate is 80%, and median survival 36 months. And let's move to the squamous cell carcinoma of the unknown primary site. And this looks like uh, patients with advanced head and neck cancer. You can have as an investigation approach a bilateral tonsillectomy or PET scan, as I said before, is quite helpful. And if you have N1 or N2 disease without extracapsular extension, you do surgery alone, you have good results. If it is more than N2B stage, or with extracapsular extension, you go for postoperative chemoradiation. And if you have patients with HPV positivity, these pa patients do better. But you don't have to treat them differently from the regular uh, squamous cell carcinoma patients. And now we move to the recently published subset of abdominal squamous cell carcinoma where there are so far only 25 cases. Patients are coming with disease in the abdomen, or retroperitoneum, or pelvis. The symptoms are abdominal pain, constipation, or, or ble vaginal bleeding. You treat them accordingly, and the outcome is quite good. Keep in mind, if you have a patient with squamous cell carcinoma of the abdomen, probably is going to do, to do, to do better than uh, other uh, CAP patients. So neuroendocrine carcinoma is a, a entity of, uh, we describe here 500 patients treated with chemotherapy with a response rate of 50 to 60 percent, median survival of 15.5 percent, but we have here some long-term survivals ending up to four or five years. Also, in a known primary Merkel cell carcinoma, a two-year survival with stage 3B is doing better than Merkel patients with a known uh, primary site. So this is the entity I was talking to you before. This is the adenocarcinoma of the colon profile. Be careful, this patient should have in the immunohistochemistry CK20 positive, CK7 negative, 
CDX2 positive and CEA positive. And look at these patients. They present to you with abdominal nodes or peritoneal disease or liver disease or ascites. You should treat these patients like colorectal cancer. You have results like colorectal cancer with 50% response rate. You have median survival up to 37 months. And be careful, don't to miss uh, this entity. Again, we have the uh, renal cell carcinoma who present to you like a cap. But if you do all the immunohistochemistry and the histopathology, and treating like uh, renal, renal cancer with sinitinib, bazopanib, etc., et you'll get a response rate of 40 to 50 percent, a medium PFS of 8.5, and a median survival up to 16 months. And I'm moving now to the mm, poor prognostic, the unfavorable subsets, which unfortunately they are 80 percent of all cases. So. These are the 80% uh, of unfavorable subsets, metastatic carcinoma of the liver, ascites, brain metastasis, lung metastasis, or bone metastasis. And if you put them all together, you'll find out that the response rate is less than 20%, and median survival, unfortunately, is around five months. This registry from University of Ontario is very useful. They compare something like 45,000 patients with known metastatic disease, with known primary, and almost 1,700 patients with CAP. And what they found out was that patients with known primary, treated versus untreated, was 19 versus 2.2 months, and CAP patients treated versus untreated was 3.6 versus 1.1. And the overall survival is 11.9 versus 1.9, which means that patients with CAP, most of them, they don't do well. Uh, this is the study which published in 2013 in Journal of Clinical Oncology, where they provide chemotherapy or other kind of treatment according to the immunohistochemistry. Uh, they pretend that the median survival was 12.5 months. This was not something important, but they are uh, believe that this is something new, and this is the curve. Keep in mind that this study, along with this study, they showed some benefit of survival if you treat patients with specific treatment, but keep in mind these two, pa two papers are not a randomized control uh, prospective study. They are observational studies. So what we need today in order to say to all of you that we can treat cancer of a non-primary uh, quite well, we need one of these or these two studies which are there for some years, which compare with a prospective randomized study, uh, the, F, the treatment of platinum-based chemotherapy versus uh, uh, immunotherapy or specific uh, treatments. Unfortunately, a few weeks ago, a paper came out in Journal of Clinical Oncology, which was a randomized phase two trial comparing site-specific treatment after gene expression profiling with empirical treatment of carboplatin paclitaxel in patients with CAP. This paper came out from Osaka, Japan. The primary endpoint was one year survival. They treat 130 patients. And if you look at the PFS, the overall survival, one year survival, there was no difference between uh, specific treatment or empirical treatment. Uh, if you go also to the NCCN clinical practice guidelines, you will see that there it's obvious. They say that you pathologists and you oncologists, you have to collaborate on the basis up to now of a good immunohistochemistry and try to get the best results by treating your patients. What about uh, targeted treatment these days? 
where do we stand today? If you ask me what, the, what are the genomic alterations in CAP, you will see that almost 85% there are clinically relevant mutations. And out of them, 13 to 16% may benefit from currently available drugs. However, what we have so far regarding TKIs or monoclonal antibodies or immune checkpoint inhibitors, I would say that we still have only anecdotal data. So we are expecting these two big studies in order to learn how to treat these patients. And now let me discuss with you asking three questions, and I need your help. This is these are critical questions on diagnosis and treatment using molecular profiling. Question number one, does molecular profiling increase accuracy of identifying the primary site? Who is in favor of that? Raise your hand. I would do. Yes, it is. And gives you this information. Question number two, does molecular profiling helps in utilizing targeted treatment? Yes and no. Yes and no. But what about question number three? Does the identification of the primary site, if you find it through molecular profiling, are you going to have a better survival? Here, the answer is we do not know. Probably not, probably yes, but we do not know. So this is very critical and very crucial. Please keep them in mind. So I will finish my talk with an al another algorithm which is going to help you. If you have a patient with diagnosed with a, with a metastatic carcinoma diagnosed by histopathology, the step one you should go through is to search from the primary side using the clinical data I gave you before, using extensive immunohistochemistry imaging and endoscopy studies. If you know, go to step two rule out potentially treatable or curable tumors. No one these days wants to lose, wants to miss a breast cancer or a germ cell cancer. And then go to step three, where you have to characterize the specific clinical pathological entity your patient belongs to, and then try to treat your patients either on a favorable uh, mission, for favorable subsets or for the bad tumors, use empirical treatment with palliative intent. And if you have enough money and you want to look for a gene profiling, even do that, but I'm not guarantee that you're going to benefit your patient. So having said that, I would like to thank you very much. And the paper is open for discussion. Thank you very much for such a wonderful, just wonderful presentation. We have time to take one question. Yeah. Wonderful lecture. I actually have two small questions, kind of. So the first one, on the last diagram, you mentioned that step one is to look for the primary site. So for me, this seems to kind of controversial because since we know that it's the metastasis that kill the patient and not the primary site, how actually necessary it is to put the looking for the primary site first, then step three, searching for the appropriate treatment? And how long are you able to wait? Like, what's the, are there any limits at how long you can look for the primary site before you actually begin treating a patient? And then um, the let's, second step, let's, yeah. Let me answer the first one. If you look at the definition of cancer of a non-primary, this is the definition. You get someone with metastatic disease here and there, and you do the routine tests to identify the primary site, and you cannot identify. Then you have the right to call this patient cancer of a non-primary. So by definition, if, if you have this patient and you need the step one, you have to go through that. Even the patient would be very anxious to know, do I have cancer and where my cancer comes from, correct? So definitely you need me. The other sub-question you, you asked me was how long you need 
to work up your patient to find the primary site. I would say you don't have to have patients in the hospital. You can do the whole thing as an outpatient. Or there are several things that you should follow the guidelines I gave you. You don't need to put him in patient. Outpatient is not. I'm sorry, my question was not regarding inpatient, outpatient, but rather yeah. the timing. Because, you know, yeah. with metastases, the disease can be pressing. You know, time, urgent so the, matter. The so time, time to work wise. up your patients should be no more than two weeks. <laughs> in two weeks, you have to run up the most basic test you need. Best case scenario. And um, just one small question. So in cases where you do not find the primary tumor at all, even after the extensive workout, could you suggest that maybe some of the cancers of unknown primary are not actually of unknown primary? Like, do you think it is possible that a subgroup of cancers that are thought to be unknown primary, the metastasis that we see is actually the presentation of the primary disease, in a way, like a scientific... You know, it's not scientific. It sounds to me a very philosophical question. Okay. <laughs> it's a very philosophical question. Well, actually, this is the story. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing which I always did in my life. If I had a patient who is young, less than 40, who has an undifferentiated tumor, I would rather go in for a gene profiling. Okay, this is very important. But if I had someone 80 years old with several metastases here and there, it's not very important to spend money to get a gene profiling, and then you don't know what treatment you should give. So if you want to be more accurately, if you have young patients, yes, to gene profile. You are obliged to do that. If it's not a young patient, you can treat them with empirical treatment. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other question? Mm. And if it's possible, um, one additional question. Uh, it's um, something about the biology of this process. Because uh, all this tumor, the tumor of uh, unknown primary origin, unknown primary, have a very interesting biological behavior that distinct uh, from many other type of uh, tumors. We have a very small, usually undetected primary, and uh, metastatic spread. Usually, sometimes it's a uh, huge yeah. metastatic mass. What do you think about the underlying mechanism? And do you study the underlying mechanism? For me, it's a key question about the metastatic process. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer your question. We try to do in our uh, in our department most of uh, the uh, molecular investigations in order to answer your question. So none of them, through, from our angiogenesis to whatever, was able to give us an answer. Your question should be as following. Do we have a genetic signature for these patients? And we try even that. And there are many people try that. And unfortunately, up to now, there is no any genetic signature on patients with a known primary. But they clearly different in yeah. behavior. It's so crazy, it's crazy disease. Yes, yes, it's very interesting. Yeah. There are three or four hypotheses, but we don't have time to discuss that. Thank you very much.